Okay, good afternoon. Uh, the first item of business this afternoon is portfolio questions. The first portfolio point of order, Sarah Boyack. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I very rarely make a point of order, but I felt it was important on this occasion to make a point of order to ensure that the answers provided by Ministers to Parliament are accurate and reflect reality. Yesterday, during the topical question in response to my supplementary question, the Minister for Green Skills, Circular Economy and Biodiversity stated, I also remind the member that barcodes are not part of the regulations passed by the Scottish Parliament and are therefore not part of the legislation that we can consider here. However, the Deposit, Return, Deposit and Return Scheme for Scotland Regulations 2020, passed by this Parliament, required European article numbers or barcodes to be included in any application for producer registration as set out in Schedule 1 of the regulations. I would be grateful if the presiding officer could confirm whether there has been any attempt by the Minister to correct the official record on this point. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Ms Boyack. I think, as uh, members have been reminded on numerous occasions, uh, there are uh, approved mechanisms for uh, amending uh, the record. It's up to members whether they choose to avail themselves of those uh, mechanisms. And uh, I think on that uh, basis, we will proceed with portfolio questions. The first portfolio is Constitution, External Affairs and Culture. Is ever any member wishing to ask a supplementary question, should press the request to speak buttons during the relevant question. And I call question number one, Sarah Boyack. To ask the Scottish Government what apologies, support... Ms. Apologies, Ms Boyack. I think we need to move the business motion first, so I'm going to call on the Minister to move the motion. Thank you, President Officer. I thought I'd come down here for no reason. Uh, moves, President Officer. I think you'll find Constitution uh, portfolio questions as well worth the, uh, the trip down from the Ministerial Office. Is that... And the question is that the motion be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We are agreed, and we can now move on to the long-anticipated portfolio questions on Constitution, External Affairs and Culture. Question number one, Sarah Boyer. Many thanks, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what support it is providing to Pakistan following the severe flooding that the country experienced in 2022. Minister Christina McKelvey. Um, the Scottish Government have provided £1.5 million in support for the people of Pakistan following the devastating floods in 2022. We have awarded £1 million in humanitarian support to the D Disasters Emergency Committee Appeal and members of our huma Humanitarian uh, Emergency Fund panel helping to deliver re relief on the ground in Pakistan. We have also provided an additional £500,000 for an existing British Council Pakistan Women and Girls Scholarships programme to double the number of school and uh, university scholarships available to women and girls in the worst affected areas, ensuring that they conti can continue their education with minimum disruption. Sarah Boyack. Can I thank the Minister for that answer and I also want to put on record my support for all those who are still involved in the aftermath, um, supporting communities to recover such as the Disasters Emergency Committee. Um, the Minister mentioned uh, direct funding to Pakistan and the Government is also in, uh, committed to increasing its International Development Fund to £15 million each year but stakeholders have told me they are unsure how the money will actually be utilised by the Scottish Government. So could the Minister outline what work the Scottish Government is doing with the international development sector in Scotland to make sure to see that the increase in the fund will be used in country, in community, and could she also outline how that increase will help communities uh, and in Pakistan to recover from the extreme weather disruption and indeed other countries, which will only increase due to the climate emergency, not just to get them back to where they were, but to build in resilience against future climate disasters. I'll call yeah, the Minister, no. but I, I, I would make the usual reminder that questions will need to be brief and, and ministerial responses as brief as possible to allow everybody to get in. Minister. Uh, thank you very much, President Officer. It's a really important question, including the issues that we have seen across Malawi with flooding and the impact of, of climate change. I've been discussing with officials over the past few weeks the work that we need to undertake, and I've met with, with members of the HEF and other organisations over the past few weeks. So I'd be keen to maybe come back to uh, Sarah Boyat with an update on what we are doing with the fund and uh, the criteria for utilising that fund and the questions she asked about how it will be utilised. I can come back and let her know. Thank you, Minister. Question number two, Ban Kothal. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government how it is supporting community based facilities in the west of Scotland region to preserve Scottish culture and heritage. Minister. 
Scottish Government supports a range of organisations which help preserve our culture and heritage in communities across Scotland. We provide targeted support for culture and heritage facilities through our funding to local authorities, organisations and public bodies, including Creative Scotland and Historic Environment Scotland. In 2022-23, Creative Scotland invested £85.4 million in the West of Scotland region. And our Culture Collective programme brings together creative practitioners, organisations and communities, importantly communities, across Scotland to work together to shape the future cultural life of their community. In West of Scotland, Culture Collective supports programmes including Inverclyde Culture Collective, Evolve and the Air Gaiety. Pam Gosson. I thank the Minister for that response. As gateways to knowledge and culture, libraries play a vital role in our society. However, under the SNP Government, they are sadly declining. In 2009 to 2010, there were 65 full-time staff employed in libraries in East Dumbartonshire. However, in 2022 to 2023, there were just 38. Local councils are having to plug budget gaps created by the SNP government cuts. So can I ask the Minister, what more will the Scottish Government do to keep our libraries open and to ensure that knowledge and cultural heritage is preserved? Minister. Yeah, Pam Gozo makes a, a, an excellent point about how important libraries are, um, and they are so important that this um, responsibility for these is devolved to local authorities, and it's a local authority's um, responsibility to take that forward. Of course, we do know about the well-being and the health and the education impact of, of local libraries, and we've been working closely with the sector in order to ensure that we can maintain libraries too. Be supplementary, Paul Sweeney. Thank you, Deputy President Officer. The Minister will be well aware of many community organisations that are trying to save Scotland's built heritage is at risk. A good example is an organisation called the Springville Winter Gardens Trust, which I am the chair, which is trying to save Scotland's largest Victorian glasshouse, which is an increasingly perilous state of dereliction and has been abandoned since 1983. We have been really struggling to try and achieve the necessary capital funds to initiate works to save this building. We should be willing to meet with me and the trustees to see if we can find a viable way forward to save this historic building, one of Scotland's poorest communities. Minister. Yeah, I know the, the Winter Gardens uh, well, um, having uh, spent a lot of time in that park with my cousins growing up, so um, I'm very well aware of it. Historic Environment Scotland's Heritage in Place programme is an area-based funding programme that aims to contribute to the development of bri vibrant and sustainable places in Scotland through community-led regeneration, exactly what Paul Sweeney is speaking about there. I'd be happy to meet with Paul Sweeney and the organisation because we've got a number of ways that we can support communities in order to ensure that they do uh, maintain and sustain and keep for the future that heritage. Thank you. Question number three, Finlay Carson. To ask the Scottish Government what its response is to the reported comments by Scottish Opera regarding the disbanding of an orchestra due to the lack of young people in the industry. Minister. We know that participating in cultural activity from a young age boosts our well-being and helps us to develop valuable life skills. The Scottish Government provides significant funding to support access to music and the arts for young people across Scotland. This includes £9.5 million this financial year, announced just recently by my colleague Angus Robertson eh, for the Youth Music Initiative. I understand that the orchestra, which formed part of Scottish Opera Young Company, was disbanded about five years ago, but the Scottish Opera Young Company is still going strong and is supported by Scottish or or Opera's main orchestra. Yeah, yeah. Carson. Yeah, I thank the Minister for that response, but despite the SNP commitment in 2021-22 to remove fees from all pupils learning a musical instrument, data now shows that 92% of pupils are missing out. Specifically in my constituency and in Dumfries and Galloway, the number of pupils taking a musical instrument has declined by almost 500. And at least one school in the constituency, um, music is no longer being offered as an in-school subject despite pupil demands. Can the, the Minister explain how the SNP intends to keep their manifesto promise of removing barriers to music education and ensuring all Scottish pupils have access to this? Minister. <clears throat> I'm very happy to work um, across the board with any organisation, including our local authorities, to look at more ways in which we can ensure that our young people get the access um, to music tuition and all that comes with it. Um, that's why that youth... Um, a, that, that, investment in the Youth Music Initiative is incredibly important. It is delivering on our commitment to expand this into other art forms, and it is also ensuring that Youth Music Initiative is 
uh, com you know, used very well in local uh, authorities. Um, it also covers other art forms beyond uh, music, and I think we need to ensure that uh, that is targeted in a way that supports children and young people's health, wellbeing, personal development through the arts and their creative uh, activity. And as I say, I'm happy to work across the board with any uh, local authority or organisation who is working on this. And I've just recently met with the chair of the COSLA Wellbeing Board to reinstitute the work of the Culture Chairs Committee, and we'll be meeting soon, so I'll raise it there. Mm -hmm. I'm briefly Faisal Chaudhry. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, instrumental music teaching is an area that has been drastically reduced by some councils to keep up with the budget cuts. Uh, this means thousands of children in Scotland may not have the opportunity to learn how to play the musical instrument uh, at school. What assessment have the Scottish Government made uh, about the impact of this on the ability of the industry to continue to recruit young musicians? Minister. The organisations who are recruiting young um, musicians into all of the different aspects of this are working very hard in order to, to, to keep doing that. That's why that youth music initiative investment is so important. And I'd be happy to work with anyone across the chamber. This does not need to be a political issue. It needs to be an issue about how we ensure our children get the best out of their education. But that investment is really important, and it would be great if the opposition would welcome it. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Question number four is withdrawn. So question number five, Paul O'Kane to ask the Scottish Government how it is supporting local theatres. Minister Christina McKelvey. The Scottish Government values the importance of the arts and local theatres for the many benefits they can bring, such as nurturing creativity and improving health and wellbeing. The Scottish Government provides support to local theatres through funding to Creative Scotland for their regularly funded organisations, which include world-class theatre. Independent local theatres in Scotland are also eligible to apply to Creative Scotland's open fund for specific projects or productions, and I would urge them to do so. Paul O'Kane. I thank the Minister for that answer. This year, the Beacon Arts Centre in Greenock celebrates its 10th birthday, a significant achievement reflecting its status as a much-loved cultural institution, uh, the continuation of the Arts Guild in Greenock that was founded in 1946 and much loved by people in Inverclyde and across West Scotland. Unfortunately, it is the case that the Beacon is often seen as an exception rather than the rule, with too many community theatres struggling for survival due to the inadequate financial support. Indeed, the decision of the former Finance Secretary to reverse the proposed £6.6 .6 million cut to the culture sector back, to, back in February was a welcome step. However, Creative Scotland should not have been threatened with such a significant financial cut in the first instance. Therefore, I would ask the Minister, does she agree with me that cultural institutions like the Beacon Arts Centre in Greenock are invaluable local assets, and will she agree to meet with me to discuss funding for various theatres in West Scotland who are in real peril? Minister Christina McCall. Um, it, it's a quick answer, President Officer. Yes and yes. Thank you very much. Uh, supplementary, Fiona Hislop. Uh, the Minister may be aware of West Lothian Leisure's proposals to close the Howden Park Centre and Theatre in Livingston and West Lothian after the Labour-led Conservatives supported West Lothian Council has to pr proposed to withdraw all management fee funding from the Trust in future years. What more can the Scottish Government do to ensure that local authorities are meeting their statutory responsibilities under the Local Government and Planning Scotland Act 1982 to provide cultural facilities? Simply owning buildings surely is not enough. Communities need a local cultural strategy and at least some financial contribution to the running of cultural services. Minister. Um, I understand the concerns raised about the future of Howden Park Centre, although local authority provision is entirely a matter for each local authority. I do understand that Creative Scotland are in initiating discussions with West Lothian Council about the potential closure in view of the redevelopment grant previously given to the centre. The Scottish Government's COVID-related additional funding for West Lothian Council included £4.2 million in recognition of the loss of income during the pandemic in respect of leisure centres such as the Howden Park Centre. And more broadly, we continue to work in partnership with COSLA and the Culture Conveners Group, a forum originally instigated by Fiona Hislop at both local and national level to identify ways to strengthen services around the principle of cultural recovery and renewal. Question number six, Edward Mountain. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what percentage of Creative Scotland's total awards funding was allocated to the Highlands and Islands in the last financial year. Cabinet Secretary. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, Creative Scotland provide a range of support for cultural activities and organisations uh, across all regions of Scotland through their network of regularly funded organisations, uh, the Open Fund or their various other funding streams. In the financial year 2022 to 2023, 
8.7% of Creative Scotland's total funding awards were allocated to projects in the Highlands and Islands. Edward Main. And I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. Given the size of the area involved, I, I would have hoped for more, but I, I anticipate he expected that answer. Eden Court Theatre is a very valuable asset to the community of the Highlands. The venue has supported residents through the global cost of living crisis with its warm welcome and the introduction of low-income tickets. Like many other Scottish theatre venues, though, Eden Court continues to face significant funding challenges. Will he agree to look at what further funds could be made available to them in these difficult times? Come and see. <clears throat> well, uh, the Eden Court in Inverness is the largest arts venue in, in the Highlands. It includes two theatres, it includes two multi-purpose studios, two cinemas and three art galleries. I think it underscores the importance that Edward Mountain rightly raises in the Chamber. The Eden Court receives regularly funded, uh, regular funding from Creative Scotland of half a million pounds a year. They also receive support as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic, including £242,000 for recovery from the COVID-19 pandemic. Pandemic. Uh, and something else that I think is worthy of mention is that the Eden Court Youth Theatre provides dance and theatre classes to young children aged five to eight years and holds theatre workshops inviting schools across Scotland and are, and are well known for their work right across the Highlands and Islands and not just in Inverness. So I totally agree with Edward Mountain how important the Eden uh, Court Theatre is uh, and the support that the Scottish Government and through it Creative Scotland gives and I hope that that continues long into the future. Question number seven, Mercedes Vialba. To ask the Scottish Government whether it will provide an update on its progress in establishing a peace institute by the end of 2022, as set out in its 2021-22 programme for government. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, presiding officer, the Scottish Government commissioned an independent report last year to advise on the establishment of a peace institute. Scottish ministers have endorsed the report's proposed path to establishing a full-fledged peace institute, and the Scottish Government remains committed to this ambition. However, since the report's release in June 2022, the financial situation facing Scotland and the Scottish Government has deteriorated and is the most challenging since devolution. So in difficult economic times, difficult decisions are required to be made and ministers have reluctantly agreed to delay further work on the Peace Institute until later this parliamentary term. Mercedes Vialba. I thank the Minister for that response. The Scottish Government's commitment to establishing the Peace Institute was that it would have a focus on human rights. Yet Scotland's own police force, Police Scotland, signed a training agreement with Colombia in 2020. Colombian police subsequently killed over 40 people during protests in 2021 and detained hundreds of young people on spurious charges, many of whom remain in prison. So can the Minister confirm what discussions he has had with Scottish Government ministers to ensure that the Peace Institute's focus Focus on human rights is not undermined by Police Scotland's International Development Unit working with police forces with a record of human rights abuses. Cabinet Secretary. So I think I'm right in saying that this is not the first time the question has been raised by the member uh, in the chamber. I think it's absolutely right and proper that we look at the highest uh, possible maintenance of human rights standards where, where any Scottish uh, public institution uh, is involved. I think it's also right to say uh, that it's important where practicable that efforts are made to help and support the changing of cultures in other parts of the world which do not maintain the high standards of human rights that we enjoy in this country. But I'll reflect on what the member says and undertake to write back to her. I've got a number of supplementaries. I'm going to call first Audrey Nicholl. Thank you. Can the Cabinet Secretary reflect on the success of the Scottish Council of Global Affairs, which has fulfilled the programme for government pledge to coordinate Scottish expertise and research on global issues and their impact on Scotland? Cabinet Secretary. Since the launch last year, the Scottish Council on Global Affairs has made excellent progress in establishing itself as a crucial, as an impartial Scotland-based research institute, providing a hub for informed, non-partisan debate on a wide range of global issues. The three founding universities of Edinburgh, Glasgow and St Andrews have made significant progress in harnessing the breadth of expertise that Scotland-based researchers have to offer. I'm glad to see that the Institute benefits from the support not only from the Scottish Government, but also from the UK Government and from across the political spectrum. Through their research programme and suite of regular events, they've begun to help foster vital public discussion around key global issues of relevance to Scotland. I'm excited to see the plans that they have for the future. Thanks, Sharon Dowie. 
Thank you, Presiding Officer. I have previously asked that about the location, cost and remit of the proposed Peace Institute on three separate occasions, but no answers have been provided regarding these specific points. Can the Cabinet Secretary use this opportunity to share how much money has been spent so far, the projected cost and the number of civil servants involved? Mm -hmm. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, yes, I will be happy to do so. And Willie Rennie. I am surprised this manifesto commitment has been dispensed with. We have got wars in Ukraine, we have got the conflict in Sudan, we have got the conflict in Yemen. If Scotland is going to make a big impact on the world in resolving conflicts, why does not the Government prioritise this? Well, this is a priority for the Government during this parliamentary uh, term, but I am happy to share uh, the reply that I've, the commitment that I have given to, to write to the member from the Conservative benches uh, on this subject. I think he does understand the financial constraints that the Scottish Government is working under. I think he also knows the commitment that the Government has to supporting peace and reconciliation uh, efforts around the world. Uh, I am confident that we will make progress on that during this parliamentary term, and I look forward to the support of all parties for this initiative, as there has been for the Scottish Council for Global Affairs. Question 8, Ros McCall. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what action it is taking to accelerate the reopening of sites currently closed due to inspections by Historic Environment Scotland. Minister Christina McKelvey. Um, Presiding Officer, we are providing Historic Environment Scotland with £72.7 million this year, a record high level to help maintain Scotland's heritage and historic environment. This is an 82.6% increase on pre pandemic funding. With their commercial income, Historic Environment Scotland's operating budget this financial year is £114.5 million, which is 22.4% higher than pre-pandemic. Historic Environment Scotland has completed the first group of inspections in its prioritised inspection programme on schedule and is making progress on the next group of prioritised sites, which will be completed by the end of this year. They continue to put the health and safety of individuals first, reopening sites only when it's safe to do so. Rose McCall. I thank the Minister for the answer. In 2022, Elcha Castle closed due to Historic Environment Scotland inspections with no known date of being reopened. It is considered one of Scotland's best preserved tower houses from the 1500s and a favourite spot for family day trips. So, Can the Minister assure me that the reopening of Elcha Castle will be a priority so families can enjoy it during the summer months and that the local economy is no longer adversely affected? Minister. Yes, um, I can give um, uh, Rose McCall the assurance that I will have Historic Environment Scotland look into the particular site that she mentions and come back to her with a most up-to-date position on that. I think these inspections and the repairs and all the work that's been done are moving on at pace and it changes almost on a daily basis. So getting, you, getting Rose McCall that most up-to-date position from Historic Environment Scotland is probably the best answer at this time. Thank you, Minister. That concludes portfolio questions on constitution, external affairs and culture. There will be a brief pause before we move on to the next portfolio to allow front benches to change. Okay, the next portfolio is Justice and Home Affairs. As ever, if um, a colleague wishes to ask a supplementary question, I'd invite them to press the request to speak buttons during the relevant questions. Uh, there is quite a lot of interest for supplementaries in this uh, section, so I would invite uh, members to be as brief in their questions and ministers to be as brief in their answers as possible. And I call question number one, Jeremy Balfour. Uh, thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government when the next regular review of the Sentencing Young People Guidelines is due to take place. Cabinet Secretary. Signing officer, the timing and form of reviews of sentencing guidelines are, of course, matters for the Independent Scottish Sentencing Council. Their review process for offence and offender-specific guidelines is that after one year they will consider data on relevant cases and engage with sentencers to assess whether the guideline has had the intended effect and identify any unintended consequences or emergent trends as a result of the guideline. After three years, they will review the data on relevant cases over this period and engage with sentencers on their experience of using the guidelines and publish a review of the guidelines operations detailing the impact of the guideline over the medium term. Jeremy Balfour. Can I thank the Cabinet Secretary for her answer? The SNP's sentencing quango introduced the sentencing young people's guidelines in January last year. 
which apply to all criminals under the age of 25 and allows them to get off with lighter sentences. This is despite widespread opposition from the public, 71% of whom said the guidelines should not apply to such a high age limit. We have now seen these guidelines used so that rapists avoid jail, murderers get much reduced sentencing time. Cabinet Secretary, why did the First Minister, who was Justice Secretary at the time, support these guidelines and when will they be developed? Cabinet Secretary. No, officer, um, if, if the member doesn't mind, I would like to uh, correct him. This isn't the SNP's sentencing guidelines. Uh, this is the Scottish Sentencing Council's guidelines, uh, a matter in which Parliament as a whole had a voice on in 2010 uh, in the Criminal Justice and Licensing Act, where the, the form and function and role and responsibilities of the Sentencing Council was set out uh, and agreed by this Parliament. Uh, I have set out to the member that the processes in which the Sentencing Council keep under review their guidelines. They do uh, take very seriously uh, their responsibilities in engaging with the public uh, and informing the public in terms of the role and purpose of sentencing, which of course includes rehabilitation, but it also includes punishment. And brief supplementary, first from Audrey Nicholl. Thank you. Um, I understand that sentencing guidelines are clear that a prison sentence remains an option for the court when it comes to heinous crimes such as rape and murder. So can the Cabinet Secretary provide figures for the number of rape convictions that resulted in a custodial penalty since 2018? Cabinet Secretary. Presiding officer, the latest published statistics uh, that cover the period up to 31 March 2021, uh, between uh, 1 of April 2018 and the 31 March 2021, 327 people have been convicted of rape, uh, and of those, uh, 322, that is 98%, uh, received a custodial sentence. And of course, rape trials are dealt with in the High Court. The High Court has uh, unlimited sentencing powers, including up to uh, life sentencing. And of course, members uh, might uh, be interested to know that the, the average uh, sentence for rape is six years, eight months, and that prison sentences uh, have, on average, across all offences, increased by 14%. And briefly, Katie Clark. There have now been a number of cases where there's been huge public concern about the sentences given to offenders convicted of rape, where the judges said that the sentence was significantly reduced due to the young person's sentencing guidelines. Given these guidelines were introduced and have created a significant change without the involvement of Parliament, will the Cabinet Secretary do what she can to ensure that there is a debate on the impact of these regulations in government time? Cabinet Secretary. Presiding so, officer, as I stated to Mr Balfour, that Parliament uh, did have its voice uh, when it passed legislation uh, on the powers uh, of the Sentencing Council. Um, I was certainly in Parliament that time. I sat in the Justice Committee uh, and I can assure members there was certainly um, a fulsome uh, debate on these matters. There wasn't necessarily uh, consensus in all, all matters of, of, of detail. But in terms of the Sentencing Council's uh, functions in terms of reviewing, they will have, as I've outlined, uh, an interim review looking at uh, initial decisions that have been made, where the guidance has been applied, but also in those cases if the guidance has not been uh, applied, because it is, of course, uh, up to judicial discretion whether they choose to apply uh, the guidance, uh, but they would, of course, have to uh, provide uh, written reasons for that. And, of course, over a three-year period, once uh, perhaps court uh, processes and the appeal court processes um, have been fulfilled in relevant cases, you will see much more uh, robust and thorough data that will be published uh, by the Sentencing Council. Thank you. Question number two, Ruth Maguire. Sir, to ask the Scottish Government how forthcoming legislation will advance the rights of child victims of crime. Minister Siobhan Brown. The Scottish Government is committed to advancing the rights of child victims through legislative and non-legislative measures. Both the Victims, Witnesses and Justice Reform Bill and the Children Care and Justice Bill contains provisions to increase protection for the privacy and dig dignity of child victims. We recognise that children find aspects of the system particularly traumatising, so will benefit from the trauma-informed and person-centred approaches that underpin the legislation. We have also published our vision for the Bans Hoos, a transformational whole, whole system approach to delivering child protection, justice and health support and services to child victims. Ruth McGuire. 
I thank the Minister for that answer and welcome the measures that she outlined. Does the Minister agree with me that advancing and balancing the rights of all children who come into contact with our justice system, whether child victims of criminal harm, witnesses or children who cause harm to others, is of the utmost importance and that any legislation made in this place must get it right for every child? Minister. Yes, I do agree, um, and this is to be finally, it's a finely balanced area. Care must be taken to ensure the Kilbrandon ethos of the children's hearing systems, which has the needs and welfare of the child, is a subject to the referral at its centre, and it's not compromised. The rights of the child victim must therefore be carefully balanced against the right of the referred child whose privacy and welfare needs are being considered by the children's hearing. And crucially, children's hearings are not criminal justice settings and are welfare-based rather than being in a punitive system. Bruce Supplementary, first from Russell Finlay. Yeah, thank you. Uh, one in four cases sent to children's reports are for alleged crimes, often serious, yet Victim Support Scotland describes an information vacuum with victims not being entitled to details of their cases. So will the Minister ensure that victims are no longer kept in the dark and that their rights are central to this new bill? Minister. Thank you. If, if the child is placed in a secure care care via the hearing system, the provisions which govern information sharing in the children's hearing system allow for information about whether a compulsory supervision order has been made or how the children's hearing was otherwise changed. There is no provision within the bill to share information beyond this because it is not an offence or behaviour alone that determines where a child is placed and for how long. The system takes a holistic approach and considers how the child's welfare needs, as well as offence and behaviour, agree, engage with a secure care criteria. And briefly, Martin Whitfield. Very grateful, Deputy Presiding Officer. The Independent Strategic Review of Funding and Commissioning of Violence Against Women and Girls Services was published yesterday. It recommended that children and young people experiencing domestic abuse are identified as victims in their own right in law. How does the Scottish Government intend to respond to this recommendation? Minister. Thank you. The, the review was just launched yesterday and we are considering um, the review that, we, that was um, launched. Um, the bill is a, the, a part of a wider strategic program of work, including the Children Care and Justice Scotland Bill and the Bairns Hoos, with ongoing engagement taking place with officials leading on this area to ensure a joined-up approach across government. Question number three, Alexander Stewart to ask the Scottish Government what its position is on the introduction of whole life sentences as an option for judges in relation to the most serious offences. Cabinet Secretary. Sign officer, judges in Scotland set the punishment parts of life sentences. The punishment part of a life sentence is a period that must be served in custody. Under this long-standing law, judges have the power to set a punishment part that exceeds the remainder of a prisoner's natural life. This can result in a whole life sentence in individual cases. The Scottish Government supports the courts having these powers available for the most serious offences. Alexander Stewart. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that response. The horrific case of Joe Bartley, who was murdered in a medieval way, according to the judge uh, who presided over the case, was required under Scots law to impose a punishment which resulted in the sentence being 24 years, reduced from 29, due to the murderer being under the age of 25. The sentence means it is feasible that in this vile case the murderer could be released in his 40s. Does the Cabinet Secretary not agree that judges should be, at the very least, have the opportunity to impose whole life sentences for such barbaric cases? Cabinet Secretary. Presiding officer, and of course our thoughts and prayers are with all of those impacted by the, the brutal um, murder of, of Miss Barclay. And uh, with respect, um, if I can say to uh, Mr Stewart, uh, I have just made very clear to this Parliament what the law currently is, that punishment parts can exceed a prisoner's natural life. Uh, and he will also be aware that life sentence prisoners have no uh, automatic release. And he might be interested to look at the information provided uh, by the Parole Board for Scotland, he will get a sense um, of the, the seriousness in which the Parole Board uh, take their duties. And for example, in 2021, um, they only released a small proportion um, of people who came up for uh, parole uh, on release on parole licence. But I do believe that we should be uh, leaving this in the hands of the judges uh, and, and the experts. Uh, they will, of course, um, 
through their own sentencing statements make clear what guidance they have and have not taken into consideration. Uh, but I repeat that since the early 2000s, the punishment part of a prisoner's sentence can exceed their natural life where a judge decides that is appropriate. And I would contend, Mr Stewart, that that is an appropriate decision for a judge and not a politician. Yeah, yeah. Supplementary. Yeah, yeah. Colette Stevenson. Thank you, President Officer. Can the Cabinet Secretary confirm that prisoners can already be kept in prison by an order for lifelong restriction when there is a concern of public safety and that it was the SNP in government that ended the previous system of early release for serious offenders introduced by the Conservatives. As briefly as possible, Cabinet Secretary. Uh, yes, thank you, President Officer. I can, of course, confirm that prisoners serving orders for lifelong restriction uh, remain in custody if there is a concern about public safety. In 2021-22, the Parole Board considered uh, for parole 90 prisoners serving these sentences and not one was released. Mm -hmm. That shows how seriously the Parole Board uh, take their responsibilities. And yes, it's a matter of record that it was this government that ended automatic uh, early release for the most dangerous offenders in 2015. Question number four, Claire Hawkey. To ask the Scottish Government what its position is on whether the Protection of Workers, Retail and Age Restricted Goods and Services Scotland Act 2021 has assisted the police in responding to reports of assault, threat or abuse of retail workers. Minister Siobhan Brown. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Information provided by Police Scotland indicates that in the period since the Act came into force in August 2021 to February 2023, more than 5,000 reports of assaults or threatening abusive behaviour against retail workers has been received. It is clear this number of reported incidents is very concerning and unacceptable, but I do hope it also shows that retail employees are aware of the legislation and are using it. Last November, Police Scotland launched the National Partnership Assault Pledge, not part of the job, and have established a retailers forum where retailers can discuss issues and concerns and share best practice. Clear Hawking. I thank the Minister for that answer. I have recently been contacted by representatives of the GMB trade union who have informed me that the Asda Blantyre store in my constituency has been the target of anti-social behaviour. This has seen staff threatened and feeling intimidated. Now, clearly no one should have to put up with violence, threats or abuse in their workplace. Can the Minister outline the work the Scottish Government and the police are doing to promote awareness of the law, to ensure retail staff know their rights and, most importantly, to deter such behaviours from occurring in the first place? Minister, and could I ask you just to move your microphone slightly towards you? Thanks. Thank you. I very much agree no one should have to, have to put up with violence or threats in their workplace. We fully support law enforcement agencies having extensive powers to deal with such incidents. When the law came into force in 2021, the Scottish Government worked with Crime Stoppers, Fearless and the Scottish Grocers Federation to run an awareness raising campaign. And I agree it is important workers and retailers know that this new law can help to protect them. In addition, the member may be interested to know that a business crime prevention team within Police Scotland carries out business engagement days throughout Scotland to support the retail sector. And they've implemented the Your Safety Matters external partners group, which consists of 14 members, including representatives from the retail centre. And can I assure the member the Scottish Government takes this matter very seriously? And I'm coincidentally meeting Dr Peter Schema from the Scottish Federation, Grocers Federation, this afternoon on this particular issue. And briefly, Jamie Green. Uh, thank you. Uh, of the 5,000 reports of abuse mentioned by the Minister, uh, what was lacking in the answer was how many were actually prosecuted. i uh, be uh, grateful for that information. And of those that were prosecuted, did anyone receive a custodial sentence, given that this bill carries a maximum of 12 months penalty, which under the presumption against short sentences means no one will actually go to prison for such an offence? Minister. I, I thank Jamie Green for that question. I don't have the figures at hand, but I'm happy to write to you with those figures. Question number five, Brian Whittle. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer, to ask the Scottish Government what steps it is taking to ensure that police officers are fully resourced. Cabinet Secretary. Presiding Officer, we are fully committed to using the resources available to us to support the vital work of the Scottish Police Authority and Police Scotland. We are investing £1.45 billion in policing this year. Policing is and will continue to be a priority for this government. Uh, as well as having more police officers per capita in Scotland than England and Wales, uh, our police officers are also the best paid, supported by over £11.6 billion of funding since 2013. This investment is delivering benefits. Police recorded uh, crime has fallen by 42 per cent since 2006-07 and is currently at one of the lowest levels seen since 1974.
Brian Whittle. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that response, but in a recent uh, meeting with the Chief Superintendent, he informed me of the 15,000 call-outs that uh, the police had in April. Only 19 per cent of them were for criminal activity, with the majority of the remaining call-outs being for, men for mental health-related, against a backdrop of the reducing police numbers, drop of 600 since 2017, the hollowing out of backroom staff and increasing mental health issues in reality. Does the Cabinet Secretary recognise that the pressures are increasing on the police force and that the role they are, that they are there to do is becoming under threat? Cabinet Secretary. Side so, officer, I very much recognise that uh, Police Scotland uh, is under pressure in terms of the amount of time and the calls uh, that they get to um, help and support very uh, vulnerable people, quite often people with uh, mental health problems. This is a matter I have, of course, discussed uh, with the Chief Constable, SPA and also staff uh, associations. Um, and I have uh, gave them my commitment that we do need to find better ways of working. I think the Chief Constable is absolutely right to say that we won't be following um, uh, practice in the Met, for example, that policing in Scotland does have a responsibility on broader safety and broader uh, wellbeing. But I do think it is not beyond our wit to find better ways of working to ensure that both uh, the justice system and the, the health system works better together to actually provide a better service to some of our most vulnerable uh, citizenships. Uh, and that's actually in everybody's interest, uh, not least police officers. And briefly, Fulton McGregor. Uh, thank you, President Officer. Can the Cabinet Secretary provide any details about the starting salaries for police officers in Scotland compared to their counterparts elsewhere in the UK? Cabinet Secretary. So, you know, so police officers, as we know, play a, a vital role in keeping Scotland safe, and I am pleased that our, our officers are the, the best paced best paid in the UK. This recognises the hard work and dedication provided by Police Scotland. Officers in Scotland at the maximum pay for each and every rank it will earn more than their counterparts in England and Wales, with the basic starting salary for a constable in Scotland around £5,000 more than in England and Wales. Question number six, Pam Duncan Glancy. To ask the Scottish Government what measures it will put in place to support women in the immediate days and weeks after they leave a coercive and abusive relationship. Cabinet Secretary. Poseidon Officer, domestic abuse is abhorrent and I encourage anyone experiencing it to seek help and to report incidents to the police. Our Victim Surcharge Fund and Victim Support Scotland's Emergency Assistance Fund are already in place, providing immediate expenses for women fleeing abusive relationships. Through delivering Equally Safe, we will provide approximately £12.5 million in 2023-24 to domestic abuse support services, including women's aid organisations who provide specialist support and access to temporary accommodation. Additionally, our Victim Centred Approach Fund provides £18.5 million from 2022 to 2025 for specialist advocacy support, and we support the Scottish Women's Rights Centre who offered free legal advice to women experiencing gender-based violence. Pam Duncan Glancy. Thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. Last week, a woman came to my surgery to highlight the financial vulnerabilities and insecurity of many women leaving domestic violence situations. Many in such situations are left, as we've heard, financially insecure and, because of the coercion experienced, are isolated with few opportunities to build connections and get work. So, can I ask the Minister what support is available to women in the immediate days after leaving a relationship? and specifically to help them re-access employment and training when the time is right? And would the government consider a mentorship or peer support scheme to be put in place at this point to help women rebuild the connections they need? Cabinet Secretary. So, officer, I won't repeat the um, various funds that I outlined in my original answer, but uh, Ms uh, Glancy-Smith makes um, an important uh, point. Um, she, we, we are also, in addition to what I outlined, uh, working with Scottish Women's Aid and other organisations to understand uh, what more can be done in and around establishing a fund uh, for survivors, particularly those survivors uh, with children and who are at, at risk uh, of homelessness. Uh, there is also important work being led by colleagues who are working uh, in homelessness to bear in mind that domestic abuse is one of the leading causes uh, of homelessness for women. But I think her point about mentorship and uh, enabling women uh, to get back into the workplace or, or training um, is, is well made. And of course, there are uh, various employability programmes funded by the, the Scottish Government and I will give her an undertaking that I will make sure that we have joined all the dots in that regard. We've got a couple of supplementaries. They'll need to be brief, as will the responses. First, Emma Harper. 
Thanks, President Officer. According to research published earlier this year, Scotland's domestic abuse legislation better reflects victims' experiences. Can the Cabinet Secretary outline how the Scottish Government is building on this work to ensure that victims are at the heart of Scotland's justice system? As briefly as possible, Cabinet Secretary. Yes, uh, President Officer, the domestic abuse offence has, of course, given more powers to police and courts to punish perpetrators of abuse and protect uh, people at risk. However, as the report highlights, as mentioned by Ms Harper, there is still more uh, that needs to be, to be done. And I, for one, acknowledge a very clear message that improvements could be made, for example, to how domestic abuse cases are handled to provide victims with a greater voice in proceedings and to support them through the process. And briefly, Pam Gossel. Thank you, Presiding Officer. The UK Government is providing lifeline payments to help victims leave abusive relationships and rebuild their lives. And while I welcome that the Domestic Abuse 2021 Act will allow domestic abusers to be removed from the homes of their victims, more than two years have passed since its introduction and it has still not been enforced. So can I ask the Cabinet Secretary for an update on the parts of the 2021 legislation not being enforced and whether she will match the life-saving fund here in Scotland so that we can change and potentially save the lives of hundreds of women? Cabinet Secretary. Signing officer, um, I uh, share uh, Ms uh, Gossel's points. I think it's a fair point. Uh, and let me reassure her that uh, the implementation board uh, was established to uh, work with all partners in this regard. There is also uh, an operational working group that has been established comprising of vital partners. Um, and we have done some detailed walkthrough uh, work uh, to really understand what some of the issues at a very practical level are that are standing in the way uh, to implementation. In short, um, this is around the higher than anticipated volume of cases, uh, the challenge in t tight timescales for operational justice partners and challenges in how the views of children can be gathered in the way that does not cause them additional harm. But let me say to her, I share her frustration and we are absolutely on this. Thank you. Got a couple more questions. I'm going to get through those, but no supplementaries. Firstly, uh, Polly McNeill, question seven. Thank you. To ask the Scottish Government what its position is and whether there are any gaps in Scots law in relation to tackling image-based sexual abuse. Cabinet Secretary. President Officer, there are a wide range of criminal laws related to image-based sexual abuse. This includes legislation concerning indecent images of children and the offence of coercing a person to view a sexual image. Since 2016, it has been an offence for a person to share an intimate image of another person where they either intend to cause that person to suffer fear, alarm or distress, or are reckless as to whether the sharing of the image would be likely to cause fear, alarm or distress. However, we keep the criminal law under review and will always consider if further legislation is needed. Polly McNeill. Research shows that the swapping, collating and posting of nude images of women without their consent is on the rise. But unlike revenge porn, as it's it quoted, it is not a crime. The Scots law currently provides proof that the perpetrator intended or was reckless as to causing fear or alarm or distress as the Cabinet Secretary has outlined. The offence, however, is limited in that it requires proof of specific motivations, which means that many cases of cyber flashing are therefore excluded. But there is some international best practice around this, such as in New South Wales or in many US states, which criminalises the non-consensual distribution of intimate images without the requirement to show any specific motivation. And it's where I think there possibly might be a gap. I need a question, before. please. With that, would the Cabinet Secretary take a view on whether or not adopting a consent-based cyber flashing law might be beneficial here, or at the very least, would she be prepared to discuss it with me? Thank you. Cabinet Secretary. Slide officer, um, in short, I'm aware of Ms McNeill's concerns that were expressed at committee. I've seen a readout of that. Um, at face value, I'm not convinced uh, there is a gap. However, we'll look at the experience in New South Wales, and if she wishes to discuss the detail um, with me personally, I would be more than happy to do so. Thank you. Question 8, Willie Rennie. To ask the Scottish Government what its response is to reports that the second appliance at Methyl Fire Station will be withdrawn from service by the 4th of September this year. 
Minister Siobhan Brett. In common with all public bodies in Scotland, it is right that the Scottish Fire and Rescue Service reviews its operations at, to modernise and ensure they are meeting needs and delivering value for money. As part of the review, Scottish Fire and Rescue Service plans to temporarily withdraw 10 fire appliances for service from September 2023. I have been assured by Scottish Fire and Rescue Service that these removals will not compromise community safety. Willie Rennie. There is utter astonishment in Leavenmouth area that this fire appliance is being withdrawn. There has been a spate of fires in nightclubs, in shops, in hotels, and in fact this week in Springfield, in a little village in Springfield, there was a fire there too. Is the government sure that this is the right time to cut the fire service budget and to allow this cut at Methyl to go ahead? Minister, as brief as possible. The Scottish Government has provided Scottish Fire Rescue Service with an additional budget of £4.4 million on top of the £10 million uplift set out in the 23 to 24 budget announcement. Scottish Fire Rescue have advised me that these locations have been identified through risk modelling using historic incident data and have been assessed as being the least impactful in terms of response times for the first and second appliances attending incidents. Scottish Fire Rescue currently has in the region of 635 operational fire appliances across Scotland, and this modest reduction will allow Scottish Fire Rescue Service to ensure that the more of the remaining three, 625 operational appliances are always available for deployment, and they have extended an invitation to any member who wish to raise concerns with the local service officers to discuss this issue. Thank you. That concludes portfolio questions. There will be a brief pause before we move on to the next item of business. The next item of business is a statement by Lorna Slater on deposit return scheme. The Minister will take questions at the end of her statement, and so there should be no interventions or interruptions. And I call on Lorna Slater. Presiding officer, in 2020, this Parliament voted for a deposit return scheme for single-use drinks containers. Where the onus for dealing with the disposable, disposal and reuse of these containers is placed on the companies which produce them. The polluter pays principle. Parliament did so because it looked around the world and saw that deposit return schemes worked, with more than 50 schemes worldwide. It did so because it recognised the benefits of dramatically reduced litter, a step change in recycling rates, and having yet another tool in the fight against climate change. And that those benefits increase the larger the scope of the scheme. It did so because the case is strongest, both economically and environmentally, where schemes are all-inclusive. And it did so because it took in good faith a UK-wide agreement on the introduction of a deposit return schemes which include glass. After all, only a few months before, the UK government had been elected on just such a promise. Rishi Sunak, Alistair Jack and Douglas Ross all elected on the promise of a full deposit return scheme. The Scottish Parliament voted for the